Well, so um, this morning we have a real treat. Um, we're embarking on um, a new program for Grand Rounds where we're actually going to bring in um, a specialist in cardiovascular education on a regular basis. So we can start talking about how we educate people in medical education. And today I'm thrilled to have Dr. Katie Burlocker from the University of Pittsburgh, um, who is the program director there um, in cardiovascular uh, disease. Um, I'm not going to go through Katie's CV because more specifically I want to talk about why she's such a great person to have here today. Um, Katie told me yesterday that she actually knew she wanted to be program director as a fellow. So she actually got a master's in medical education specifically for this reason and she actually began to transition into the program director for a cardiovascular disease fellowship as early as her second year as an attending. So obviously then we have no better speaker to talk about cardiovascular medical education and medical education in general than Dr. Katie Barlocker. Thanks, Thanks Katie so. for coming. Thanks you. Um, good morning everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am flattered to be here and really excited to talk about cardiology um, training and education, medical education in general. So uh, I have no conflicts to disclose, but I'm going to tell you that there's a little bit of a warning. And Huey told me that um, I may be the first Grand Round speaker to do this. I will challenge our videographer up there. I like to talk and walk. Um, and I really like to interact with people, and that is part of Grand Rounds as well. So I, I am not going to stand behind that podium, um, and I'm probably going to ask you guys to answer questions and um, tell me a couple things about you as we move through. Okay, a um, couple things. Before I get to these objectives, can I ask everybody in the room, and I won't ask everybody on the online because I don't get to see you guys, how many faculty do we have here? Faculty, faculty, okay. And how many fellows do we have here? OK, and how many nurses or nurse practitioners do we have here? OK, any other residents, techs, anything like that? OK, all right, good. Just so that I know um, where we stand. So by the end of this lecture, I hope to teach you at least one adult learning principle. We're going to name one way in which data can influ influence medical education. We're going to talk about how interactivity will influence medical education. And last but not least, we'll describe how medical education uh, will change teachers and educators in the future. Okay? So hopefully by the end, these are at least one of these things. This is the medical educators are should are told three anywhere from three to five objectives. If I put ten up here, that would be too many. And and Dr. Zogby and I were, were talking about this yesterday. You should be able to take at least one thing away from, from a lecture, at least one. I'm gonna I'm gonna go for three or four. I don't I don't think this is too hard, okay? So let let's start. Um, and I wanted to say medical education is something that we think about from adults, right? Everybody by the time you're in medical education, you're an adult. Um, but a lot of times we think about learning and education of kids, right? Who has kids? Anybody have kids? So a lot of people have kids, and we, we think about education for childhood, and that starts really young, right? Really in, in nursery school and beyond. And I, I, went to, I went to grade school at a place called St. Joe's um, in Ohio, and this was my grade school, and it was all classroom-based. We were in classrooms of 20 to 30 kids. And then I went to high school at an all-girls Catholic high school. Um, and again, it was all classroom-based. And then I went to Duke for undergrad. And um, it was still classroom-based. Even higher education, still classroom-based. And then I went to medical school at Ohio State. So at Ohio State, back then, they had a program called PBL. So it was a track for your first two years that you could do a PBL-based, problem-based learning track which meant in the first two years of medical school, traditionally when you are in classrooms, right? Most everybody, everybody went to classroom-based two years of medical school, right? So I did not. I did, there were 35 of us that chose to be in this special track called problem-based learning where we broke into six to eight learners with two facilitators. We met three times a week for two hours and we worked through cases. Other than anatomy, and dissection, I did not go to lecture during the first two years of medical school. And this is really when I started to think about how I learned, how adults learn, and how I specifically learn. And it changed my life. Um, and, and so this is why I want to talk about adult learning and principles and theories, because it really shapes how we do medical education, I think, should shape how we evolve into medical education in the future. So the andragogy is the art, and specifically the science of adult learning. And we'll get back to what the science means in terms of adult learning. But there's a guy named Malcolm Knowles. And he put together a bunch of assumptions and principles about adult learning. And these are what we are going to 
use as our building blocks or kind of like the ground rules for adult learning and we will apply them to medical education. So a couple of assumptions that he had about adults specifically. One, self-concept moves from dependency to self-direction. As an adult, I want to tell and be in charge of what I get to learn, when I learn it, how I learn it. Okay? When I was in medical school, those first two years, when I was in PBL, I chose what books I studied from. I chose what topics I studied from. I, we even got to tell our facilitators what we wanted to be tested on. This month, I want to be tested on these five things, and they would write a test for us to be tested on those five things. Okay? So adults really like to be their own person, their own boss, in terms of what they want to learn. Next, experience is a learning resource. So experience, anything that you are doing, will help teach you. Tasks and roles make you more ready to learn. When you have something that is front of, in front of you, if you have something that you need to do, you are more ready to learn things that are related to that task or role as an adult. You're, you shift to problem-centered learning, okay, rather than subject-centered. So you don't just say, I'm going to learn anatomy here, I'm going to learn cardiology here. A lot of times in medical school, the first two years of medical school, you have a cardiology block and then you have a pulmonary block. And that's actually not really in line with adult learning. You should probably do a problem, which was the problem-based learning. We had a case. We worked on that case. I learned the things that were in that case. I learned the physiology, the pathophysiology in that case, rather than doing blocks. Okay, And last but not least, motivation becomes more internal than it is external. It's not a complete internal thing, but it is, it is more internal than it was external before. So those five assumptions then led to four principles about adult learning. And we're going to use these as we move forward to guide what we are going to do or what, what I think is going to evolve in medical education. So, so one is self-direction. Again, learners want to say and how they are learning, when they are learning, and who they are learning from. So fellows like to be a part of the process. And, and when, when your leaders are making the curriculum, they come to you and ask you, what do you think about this? Is this working? Is this not working? What do you want? Who should we bring in? Right? Next, it should be immediately applicable. Right? I don't want to learn something today that I'm going to apply in a year. That's not helpful to me. I want to learn something today that I'm going to apply this week. Right? All right. Experiential again. I need to do something. I want to hear something. I want to do something. Me just sitting here passively learning a didactic lecture is really not going to help, which is why we're going to interact in a little bit. And then last but not least, this needs to be real life. Okay? I don't want to learn something that's theoretical and never going to be applied. So, so for adults, these four things, self-direction, immediately applicable, experiential, and real. Like I said, these assumptions and principles should be our building blocks not only for medical education, but medical training. All right, so is this the future of medical education? Do you guys know what this is? Anybody use this? Anybody done something like this? What, say that again? The, oh, you know the word that I don't know that word. It's augmented reality. Augmented virtual reality, right? So, so goggles on virtual reality. Anybody done virtual reality with medical education? Yeah, a handful of people, right? And a lot of people are doing this now when they're um, um, doing some surgeries or procedures at this point, or when they're running teams. Um, so this is happening. This is a robot, okay? This is in Japan, but they're using a robot as a teacher. I don't know, maybe this is the future of our education. And this is sim, right? So you have a, play a simulation game, a sim center, where you, where you go in and you interact, interact with patients as it. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really know if this is the future of education and if this is what you thought I was going to talk about, all these like fancy technology things. You're in the wrong place this morning, OK? I'm not really going to talk about that. We can talk a little bit about how technology is going to change some things. But I think what's much more interesting is a few of these other things. So first, data, data usage. And that gets back to the science, right? Andragogy is the art and specifically the science of adult learning, science. And we need data. And you guys are a group, group of, of providers, medical providers, that use data every single day. And so we should be using data also in our, in our education. We'll talk specifically about what kinds of data and when we collect that data. Interactivity. We should probably be interactive when we are doing medical education. And that, that can be a number of different ways. And last but not least, our educators. Our educators are going to change. The role of educators in the future are going to be changed um, from what they have been to what they should be in the future. All right, so data. 
big data. This, is, this has been a, a thing here um, in, in medicine for the past decade, at least. We've been talking about big data, how it's changing things, how we use it to treat patients, um, and how, how we are using it to predict things in the future. All right, and, and so data should then verge over into medical education. And I would argue that we've already started doing this. So this is kind of MS1, MS2, med students, one, two, three, four, and then PGY, one, two, three, okay? And what is the data that we use at those different levels? So MS1, you have the admissions data and grades and participation, right? We collect that information. And then you have physical diagnosis and performance that you get a little bit more of. Then you get clerkship performance. You take all of those, those um, shelf boards. I don't know if you remember, maybe you have nightmares. I have nightmares about the shelf boards and the OSCEs. You graduate. You've got a graduation questionnaire. You've taken step one and step two for medical school. And then in residency, you start getting more, more data, right? We do clinical evaluations. We have quality data. We do chart reviews. We have a 360 review. So we've, we've really added a lot more data over the years. Let's talk about fellows. And, and Huey and I talked a little bit about this last night. So the in-training exam, all of the fellows take an in-training exam, and this may, um, uh, may not bring up good memories for, for all of the fellows because it's, it's not necessarily a fun experience. But um, this, is, this is some of my in-training exams. So I don't know if you guys show, I don't know if you show the in-training exam things. But so when we get, when we get the in-training exam um, data back from all of our fellows, all of my fellows, my first, second, and third years all take the in-training exam. Every single year they all have to take it. Um, I actually don't tell my, my fellows to study. I just say take it and we'll see how you do. Um, so I get this back, and this, this up here, right at the very, very top, which you probably can't see, says your program's minimum score was 54, your program's maximum score was 82, and down here, the overall mean of all programs was 63, and my mean score for my program was 67. So not bad, they did pretty good. And then the next year, uh, I get the same, right? And then it says mean score this year is 61. However, so that, that gives me some data. That's helpful. I like to track it a little bit, right? I think what's a little bit more helpful is the breakdown of the data, which is here. So this breaks down on the left. You can see all of the subject areas. And this is, this is the data that I get. This is, I see all of the subject areas. And then I also get to see my first year fellows. So in this column, this first column, this is my fellows. And this is all fellows across the nation. Again, my fellows, all fellows across the nation, all second year fellows my third year fellows, all third year fellows across the nation, right? So I can compare and contrast how they are doing. That's actually pretty helpful, right? And I can say the blue on the left-hand side of my first year fellows, these are actually pretty good. So we are above the standard here in arrhythmias and above the standard here in peripheral vascular disease. Bad news. Somehow I make my fellows stupider in peripheral vascular disease. Somehow my program harms them. <laughs> they, get, they remember less by the time they are third year. And my third years now didn't learn very much valvular disease, right? So I can look at this and say, I need to work on probably peripheral vascular disease and valvular disease if my third years are at this point, that those are the things across the board that we need to work on. Now, I also have individuals. So you guys get individual data about how you did on your in-training exam. And I actually make, and hopefully me sharing this will not make you guys have to do more work, but I, I make all of my fellows then reflect on their scores and give me a learning plan, an individualized learning plan about their specific weaknesses and tell me exactly what it is that they're going to do to account for that. Now, we give you a bunch of resources, but again, back to adult learning principles. I'm going to give you some data. You tell me how you want to learn. You guys figure it out. I'm, I'm here. You tell me if you need resources. You tell me anything else. I'm happy to make that happen, but you guys have to be a part of this. I want to make, you have to work with me in order to get to the point um, that you can be above the average by the time you're a third year. All right, so this is, this is one thing in training exams. But performance data, so this is a whole new thing that came out, I don't know, like seven, eight years ago that performance data was starting to be a thing. And milestones came out. So there were six competencies that was hard enough and then ACGMA came out with this thing called milestones and um, these are really stepping stones of where you should be in training. Milestones are across all of the six competencies. This is one of the milestones on communication, and there's multiple levels. By the time you get to graduation, you should be at level four, oops, level four of a milestone, right? 
to, to graduate. You communicate effectively, whatnot. So that's, that's one piece of performance. The other piece of performance that I think a lot of faculty are doing, how do we judge performance in faculty? I don't have faculty here. How do, you, how do you judge your performance? You judge performance. How do you judge performance, Bill, of your faculty? The faculty? Yeah? Uh, feedback from fellows and other faculty. Good, okay, so feedback. Some hospitals use, use HCAPs, right? And some hospitals are really starting to get at the quality quality metrics, and we, we use EPIC at, 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 um, for our outpatients. We use a bunch of different systems, but we use EPIC um, at, in our outpatient, and we've had our EPIC people build us something called a dashboard, and we have a cardiology-specific dashboard, and our fellows have this too, and you can see we have three populations that we, we just started off pretty low level, CAD population, AFib population, and heart failure population, and this will show you how many patients that they have in this, in this how many fellows, or in a fellow, they have 159 CAD patients. How many of those patients are on an aspirin? How many of them are on a statin? How many of the AFibbers have a chads vask and are on some sort of anticoagulant, right? So that's, that's a performance metric. That is, how are you doing from a quality standpoint um, in terms of your performance of your treatment? of patients. This is hard. Um, Dr. Little and I were talking a little bit about this last night, that this is, this, is, this is dirty data. If I were talking about this, this is dirty data and it's very dependent upon compliance of a patient. It's not exactly just, it's, it's really not if I'm a good doctor or not, right? Because I, it has a lot to do with whether or not they come to their follow-up appointment, if they take their medications, you know, how much time I had, how I, if the nurse called them back, all those things. So this is a, what I would say is a poor performance metric. It is going to be used. And so just for fellows and training, know that this is going to be part of it. Um, hopefully the incentives will not be based totally on this, but this is, this is going to be part of it. Where else can we get data? These are all different areas in a hospital that we are working in teams with colleagues, with other providers, in different rooms, on different procedures, at different tasks. Are there times that we can get data from this? Are there times that we can get data from this? And there are, right? So this is, this is the bane of every program director's existence, um, are these. These, these. these graphs are from the ACGME annual survey. So the ACGME annual survey is given to program directors to give to all of their fellows and all of their faculty. And then I don't know about you guys, but I get in trouble if I'm not above a certain metric with my GME, okay? So every single year, we get back this information, which on the left-hand side says program at a glance, right? And so this is the program means of the clinical experience and education, the faculty, evaluations, educational content, resources, and patient safety. This is blue is program means, yellow is national means, right? And so I get data on that. They take a survey, it's about, I don't know, like 40, is it 40 questions? 20, 30, 40, something like that. You guys take it, you probably should have taken it sometime in the past couple months. I don't have my data back from this year yet. Um, and so this is, this is what I get. I get something, this is the fellows feedback, and then this is, the, this is the faculty feedback. They do very similar things, not exactly the same, but they do supervision, educational content, resources, safety, teamwork. Okay, and then I get a program mean, a national mean. That helps me. It's, it's some information, it's some data. Not all that helpful all the time, but it's a little bit. And then there's something called CLEAR. Who's been part of CLEAR? Have you guys been a part of a CLEAR visit? Who, did you guys participate in some of those? What was it, do you remember? A lot of questions and a lot of clicking. A lot of questions and clicking. What were the questions about? Uh, safety? Yeah. Perfect, so safety is one of the highlights. So CLEAR stands for Clinical Learning Environment Review, right? This is, this is the ACGME is coming into every institution to say, let's look at your learning environment, okay? So we talked about fellows' data from their in-training exam, all those things. Now they're gonna look at your environment. Is your environment going to help you learn? And they're gonna look at these different things, your supervision, health quality, transitions of care, duty hours, fatigue, patient safety. Okay, they're looking at the entire environment now and giving you data and trying to say, this is, this is a learning environment that will help you learn or this is a learning environment that there are a lot of barriers to learn, right? That's somewhat helpful, maybe. Okay, and then you have, then you have curricular data. So this is something, so on the left, 
these are all pulled from, from, the, from online. So this is what we list. On your um, program site, this is what you say is the general rotations that you do for fourth, fifth, and sixth year. On my program site, this is what I say, general rotations that we do. Guess what? They're not different across the nation <laughs> because this is something that is mandated. But we all put up, we put up some sort of program to say this is what you could potentially do, but it's the same across the nation, okay? So we're, we're, we can put all that up. The bigger question is, What's the best way to learn in the CCU? I don't, you have a CCU, I have a CCU, a bunch of different people have a CCU. What's the best way to learn? How is your setup? Why is it the best way to learn? Is there a better way to learn in the CCU? And have you tested that? Right? Have you tested it? No. Right? In general, we've not tested the way that we learn in any of the rotations or any of the things that we do. We just do what we've been doing for a very long time. Right? This is, this is an experience. You come, show up. We talk about rounds, and we talk about patients, and we presume that you are going to learn. We've not tried many other models. We've not said this is the best way, or these are the three other ways, except for recently. So the Journal of Graduate Medical Education is a, a journal that's put out by the ACGME. And I did, a, I did a study with a woman by the name of Jill Allenbaugh, one of my mentees, about a flipped classroom curriculum. Now, this is like super psych. Do you guys have flipped classrooms? In your curriculum? No. How about residency? You guys do flip classrooms in residency? Or you know if they do it in your medical school here? Uh, in, meds. in meds, OK. Anybody ever done flip classroom? I'm just curious. Participated in what a flip classroom is? You know what a flip classroom is? No. OK. Anybody ever heard that word before? Once? OK. So flip class. <laughs> Good. This is good. Okay. We'll, 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 I'm going to backtrack for a second and talk about what a flipped classroom is. Okay. Flipped classroom is, is the opposite of what we typically would traditionally do, meaning in the traditional classroom, I come in, I give you a lecture, I teach you the content, and then I give you homework. You go home and do the problem set at home. It's what we all did growing up, right? Flipped classroom is the opposite. Right? I assign you the content to read at home, to watch a video, to listen to something. And then when you come in, my face-to-face -face time with you is working through the problem set. Okay? So that, that's the flip. Okay? And, and this has taken off really in, in a lot of high schools and colleges and even a fair amount of medical schools now that um, people don't like to go to class. They want to watch something online. And then the facilitators and learners are saying, we still need to see you and we need to work with you. And so let's work through some of these problem sets together, OK? So that's, that's a concept of a flipped classroom. It's gotten to graduate medical education. And this is a little bit dicey for me because it's not a classroom anymore. Graduate medical education, when you're in residency and when you're in fellowship, we don't have classrooms most of the time on most of our rotations. We are not teaching in a classroom. We are teaching on wards. We are teaching on floors. We are teaching the basin, patient bedside. We are not teaching in classrooms. And so this concept really is problematic to me. I'm not sure that graduate medical education is the best way to do the flipped classroom. And so we did, we did this. We, we actually put our residents through this. We did 98 residents. We quasi-randomized them to a flipped classroom versus the standard curriculum in the CCU. They had a pre and a post knowledge test and survey. And it showed no difference in knowledge, OK? Not surprising to me. Also not surprising to me is that only 35% of the, of the kids who are in the flipped classroom actually did the cases that they were supposed to do with their, with their attendings, with their fellows. Okay, So they, they had cases. They were supposed to read MixApp at home and then come in. And instead of doing half an hour of teaching, like didactic lecture in the CCU, they were going to go through the cases that we wrote. Only a third of them did the cases. right? And then only 50 of them, 50% of them, did the independent reading and learning. Not surprising. How much time do you have in the CCU to go home and read? Right? One of the hardest rotations, the most time consuming, you're exhausted. And the last thing you want to go home and do is read mix up. That sucks. It's the worst. So why, why would we do that? Right? So I'm actually not surprised. But they, actually, they liked it. They liked, of, the, of the ones that did it, they liked it. So one would argue that we probably need to start testing these different models. Right? One would argue that across medical education, whether it's medical school, residency, fellowship, even, even beyond fellowship for, for faculty and continuing lifelong learning, we should be testing these things. What is it, how do we learn best? Why? When? Right? So 
what is the future of medical education? I'm going to talk about a couple of these things that we've already that I've already discussed, and then one last piece for data. So refinement, I would argue that there's a refinement of knowledge and testing moving forward in the future. Those in-training exams are going to continue to evolve. We're going to get better at asking questions and getting more data and information about it. We're going to get better at measuring performance too. So the performance piece of whether it's milestones. Milestones, there's going to be, we are I'm on a committee that is rewriting the milestones. So milestones right now are not subspecialty specific. They are going to be subspecialty specific so that we can get better data out of those milestones. They're not, I would argue, not very helpful at all right now. Um, we'll get more accurate measurement out of environment. The clear learning reviews, those are really only two years old. Um, and so we're going to get better. They are going to get better at coming in and, and measuring you guys and our teams and patient safety and whatnot. And then we're going to have more trials about rotations and curriculas and everything like that. That they, we should test it, right? This is we are in the science of learning. We are just like we are in the science of patient care. We are in the science of learning. We should test the best ways to do this. Anything else? So this is the short-term future of medical education. I would argue that the kind of more far-term future of medical education is something called learning analytics. So this is fancy stuff. This is measurement, collection, and analysis of data about learners and their contexts, specifically their context. And it's to understand and optimize the learning environment. Okay, what does that actually mean? It looks something like this. So on the left-hand side, you see that we collect demographic information, academic information, their learning activities, meaning where, when, why, how do you learn? their context, and then other personal information about you. Financial background, your social networks, all of those things will go into how you learn. And then we're going to put it into this analytics engine, the algorithms, OK? And that means artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it's going to take all of that data and continue to use it so that what we push out is a dashboard that is predictive and proactive, OK? So the goal of this is for me to be able to say, not just when you come in as a first year fellow, to look at your in-training exam and then react to that and say, this is what I think, but to predict. But to say, actually, I think of my eight first year fellows, these two are going to do well in this, and these two are going to do well in this, and these four are going to do well in this. And they're going to have a hard time with these two things. And so I'm actually going to change their rotations based on that. I'm going to put them into different rotations based on what my learning algorithms and learning analytics have already predicted they will have a tough time with. I'm going to give them a better chance. I'm going to, I'm going to change something so that I can react to it before, before they fail. Because I, I actually would prefer to not have you fail and to not have to come back at it and to react to it, but to actually proactively predict it. So learning analytics are going to be something in the future, right? These are all of this intelli the artific artificial intelligence and the machine learning we are actually going to apply to education, OK, specifically medical education. And I, that's hard, um, but I think it's going to be helpful in the future. So all of these things, performance data, and environmental data, curricular data, and specifically a little bit further down the line is learning analytics. All right, I'm going to pause. Questions about data. Thoughts, questions, things about data before I move on. Yeah. So there's so much, we talked about this a little bit last night, there's so much available that yeah. you know, and, and every learner is going to access it different ways, Google or Twitter or up to date or whatever. So, so much access to data, lots of different ways to get to it. What's being done to sort of figure out efficiencies with access to data? Because you don't really need to memorize it, you just need right. to know how to find it. Data, are you talking about medical content or content? Data, content? Yeah. Um, so that's hard. That's, that's curation of, of data is what you're talking about. Um, I, we are still learning that. And I think a lot of the learning, the artificial intelligence and machine learning, the more that we feed in and we figure out what is used and how it is used, we can e more easily cut that out. Um, but actively right now, that is all, it's, it's by hand right now curation. Sorry. It's a not fun answer, but um, that's the truth. I, I think there is hope that this will continue. This will continue to do it itself as long as we can build the machines that that will um, figure out what we do and don't use much. Um, and places like the ACC and and Google and those those sorts of and, and I think honestly, pairing with um, the groups like Google, like Amazon, like Apple that have figured out the tech behind us. Um, with our societies that can figure out what it is, you know, that we're the content experts. Um, if we work with them, that they can, we can curate that stuff a little bit better. Other thoughts on data? Yeah, Bill. Have you tried the flipped classroom? Have you tried the flipped classroom outside 
the intensive care unit. No, and so that was because the next. I think that would. So be yeah, so that's exactly what we're doing now. That trial is ongoing right now because that was that was my that was my takeaway from from that trial was the CCU is not the right place to. We, so we actually did it in the CCU and our telemetry um, service, and they're both busy services. And so my argument was we really should be doing this on ambulatory and consults when when teams have more time. And so that trial is ongoing. We got funded this past year, and one of my residents is doing that trial on the consult service and on um, the ambulatory service right now. And hopefully, I'll be able Most to get some of our information. Conferences are, I would say, more traditional. Obviously, yeah. some case based, etc. Right. In the nation, do you see a trend? For there's the changes? yep, yep. There's more and more that are case based, and if you if you look at most of the um, larger programs across the nation that ACC puts on, the AHA puts on, a lot of people are saying we we want that we want you to start with a case, we want you to include um, questions throughout the case or throughout the lecture. Um, so that that is moving. It's slow moving, right? Because people are uncomfortable with interaction. Like I'm making you guys a little bit nervous by walking around and being like, "Hey, how about you?" Like you're lucky that I don't know all of your names, right? Because I'd be like, "What do you think?" Um, and and so that makes you a little bit nervous. And and we'll talk about why that's important, why that why a hint of nervousness and why a hint of anxiety um, actually helps you learn um, as we move forward. And so that evolution is happening. It's just going to be a little bit on the slow side. All right. Couple other pictures. What's going on in all of these pictures? Groups of people interacting, right? So interactivity is what I want to talk about next. So they're they're interacting with a screen, they're interacting with a board, they're interacting with each other. And interactivity is really important as we move forward. Didactics are known to increase short-term but not long-term retention. Adults learn better by doing. Remember that was one of the principles. Experiential learning is much more helpful. And last. They want to say in their process, and, and when, we have, when we have surveyed learners, they want to be more interactive. Not, a, not super interactive all of the time, but they want to have some interactivity. So how interactive are you in noon conference and grand rounds and journal club? How interactive are you? Very interactive today. Very interactive today, right? <laughs> okay, so grand rounds today is just super interactive. Um, on, on average, what is your journal club? What do you guys do for journal club? What's the, what's the structure of Journal Club? Every specialty has a different like, curriculum. Yep. They have their own yep. Do you guys have use PowerPoint? Do you have just a discussion in a group? Or how do you do? What's the structure or the format? Yeah, we, um, yeah, we print out papers. Uh, there's, uh, the, the articles are available. Good. But the expectation is people would have read the articles yep. before the Journal Club. OK. And it's an interactive discussion. Great. Do you have PowerPoint or no? It's just like a sit down in a group. Perfect. Yeah. I love that. OK. So it depends a little bit on the structure of your learning of your, of your Journal Club. And I would argue that a little bit of interactivity is based on what the space looks like. OK. So back in the day, this is what the space looked like. Not all that different from right now. Other than the fact that like you guys don't have like a fancy thing um, going up um, with looking down at me, that would be weird. Um, some of the educational space has changed this way, so that you sit in groups, okay. And some of the other educational spaces, this is really this is like under undergrad, um, where they sit at, at tables with with computers, right? So space and the way that you structure space changes the way that you interact, right? And so one would argue that. Grand Rounds is supposed to be didactic like that because there's a podium here and there's things. And you guys actually, it's really hard to inter interact with somebody that you're like sitting next to like this, right? Whereas if we had a square table, it would be a little bit easier. It would be hard to watch me, but maybe I wouldn't be the one that was sitting and standing up here doing all that. And so if we are going to change the way that we do Grand Rounds or Journal Club or, or Noon Conference, we might also have to think about the way that we change educational space. And that's actually what's happening. So restructured learning spaces. There's these fancy things called maker spaces. And these are workshops with tools and experts in learning and experiences to carry out ideas. And, and Dr. Little might do this with his 3D printing someday, that he builds, builds an environment where everybody can come in and make things while he's teaching, while he's doing. And I'll teach you a little bit about valves. I'll also teach you about 3D printing. And you have these machines there to build something while you are actually learning. And that would be awesome. Right? And that would actually really, really help you learn if we change the space in which we do it. Right? And that's expensive. That's super expensive and really <laughs> hard to do. So um, getting funding for that, uh, I'm not really sure where it's going to come from, but that's tough. I would argue that what's easier is doing these learning ready rooms 
So changing some of, our, some of our rooms, if you imagine this room a little bit differently where we don't have everybody facing this way, where we have whiteboards everywhere and we have a couple of things at, at tables where we can write down and things, or you can interact and walk around, right? Where I'd say, I'm gonna talk about something for five minutes, I'm gonna have you break out your groups, and you guys go to your whiteboards together and solve it, and then we're gonna come back and talk about it a little bit. If we change the space so that you can do that, you interact a little bit more, right? Rather than this, which is, makes it really hard to interact and really awkward to interact. Okay, next thing about interactivity is do you learn outside of the hospital? Do you learn at home? Do you learn over email? Thank you. Thank you. As if I planned to do, and I did not. So social media, right? Do we learn over social media? And I know, I know that this group is, uh, you guys are kind of Twitter users, which is really great. Okay, because we're going to talk about how social media, and specifically Twitter, shifts learning. Okay, so it takes, you go from an individual constructivist model, meaning knowledge is constructed by the learner, to a connectivist model, right? Meaning that knowledge is generated by information exchange. So I am learning by exchanging information and having a conversation with you. And there's a couple different ways this happens, and we'll talk about that, but you are constructing first, and we move, social media moves that to connecting and learning together. Okay, and having that conversation. How does it happen? So, so one way is discussion. So through ACC, they put up a journal club and they say this is gonna be our tweet up. We're gonna tweet about this journal article at this time and everybody gets on Twitter and we have a conversation on Twitter about a journal article. Other ways are dissection. So this is one of my fellows. He tweets a lot. Um, which is great, he's, he's a good tweeter. Although he does get into some discussions with people. Uh, sometimes I'm like, you should be careful. Um, uh, Twitter, you have to be very careful. It's be professional, right, because it will follow you. Um, so he, he put up this question that was about this EKG. And then there was a ton of discussion about this, right? And so you can follow that discussion and learn a little bit about that EKG. What did, the, what did you think? Well, I, I thought this, I thought this. How come, why not? You know, and you can ask questions, he responds, other people respond, people argue sometimes, and argument's not necessarily bad as long as you stay professional, right? That is, that, that discourse really helps us learn. And learners, really, if you guys get involved in those conversations, right, you figure out what your, what your gap is, you learn from other people, that's connecting to learn is really important and, and much better done over social media than anything else. So there's also deliberation. This is a podcast, okay? Dr. Eagle does a podcast. Not necessarily social media, but podcasts are helpful. You can, he will discuss five minutes every time. And then dissemination becomes really easy with social media. So this is Instagram. This is the New England Journal of Medicine Instagram account. And they pass out visual abstracts, which if you don't know what a visual abstract is, you can do hashtag visual abstract and find a bunch of examples of what a visual abstract is. It's wonderful, okay? New abstracts, they are put out visually so you get words and visual coding to learn together, which adults like a lot better, okay? And then you can pass this on. So I can push this out with my Instagram account. If that little icon, I can push that. I push it to my brother. My brother's a first year medical, or my brother's a first year fellow um, at UT Southwestern in cardiology. Um, he might hate me sometimes because I mean, you should read this, you should read this, how about this, right? I can push this to him. You can push this to your program director and say, hey, I just read this. Can we review this for journal club next month or next year? Um, these are wonderful things. Social media really, really helps kind of connect all of us and connect you to people that are not necessarily in your own institution. It's beyond. The future is gamification. So the interactivity, okay, of learning is wonderful. I predict, and this is already starting to happen, but I think it's going to become more and more and more popular, is gamification. So gamification in medical education is using the standard elements of game playing, meaning badges, levels, boards, anything like that, counting, or like um, competition, and applying it to learning and training. Why? Why do we do this? Why should we do this? Right? It's less risky for a learner. If I'm playing something, it's less risky. As a teacher, I can identify where my learner's gaps are. It's much easier for me to watch them play a game or play a game with them and be like, oh, you don't know that. Okay, let's, let's step back and teach that later this week. And last but not least, it releases dopamine, which helps you stay in. The outcome's not certain and the activity is fun, so you actually want to play it, right? You're a little bit nervous. Again, that edge, you're a little bit nervous, and if you're a little bit anxious, you're much more likely to, to learn. Okay. Being too scientific. Yeah, <laughs> being too scientific. You want me to not think about anything physiologic, yeah. This is a gamer's, you know, 
Right, exactly. It's gaming, right? And this is gaming. Right, it's gaming, and so let's let's keep it, let's like get something else out of gaming. Let's do it, right? So what are some examples of this? Has anybody played Sceptris? You know what Sceptris is? Gosh, okay. <laughs> Homework today. Homework today. <laughs> Go home later. Google Sceptris, okay? And this was the first game online that I ever played for medical education. It was probably like 10 years ago. That was back in the day, and it was before. So this is what it shows, right? So Sceptris is this game where you're basically learning sepsis, OK? And it's like Tetris. So there's these blocks that drop. And the blocks are the patients, right? These are the patients. And if they get to the bottom right here, they're dead, OK? <laughs> Bad news. You do not want them to drop all the way to the bottom. Okay, so this is how you play this game. And like it, there's no instructions with this game, so you kind of just have to click around. It'll make you nervous, okay? Appropriately nervous. And on the side, you have to click, and there's things at the bottom. I, I cl clicked it out, but at the bottom, you can say labs, x-ray, radio other radiology, consults. You can treat them with IV fluids. You can choose antibiotics. You can click on all these things to treat this patient, right? It'll give you his vitals up there. Maybe he comes in distressed and confused. Erythema um, involving his medial thigh, is that what this one is? I played this for like two seconds as I was preparing for this talk, and I still got like a little bit nervous because I wasn't like saving Paul immediately. As I applied, you know, IV fluids and some antibiotics to him, he slowly moves up then, right? So he, and he's less close to death, which is great, right? This is like a fun game to play. So if you have medical students or residents that are learning sepsis, go to Septris. So Stanford created this a long, long time ago. This was the initial time of, of gamification and medical education. And I would argue that we can actually do this in day-to-day in, in -day cardiology on the floor without a fancy computer, OK? So who has played Heads Up? You guys know this game? Heads Up, a handful of people have Heads Up. So ooh, Tyrese played it. Great. Um, so do you want to explain it, Tyree? Do you know what Ty do you know what heads up is? Or? It's a, you, they ask you put a name on, uh, on the screen. Yep. Right. So there's there's names, there's words, there's something. We play in two teams. My team has to get me to say the word that's on on my phone, right, or on a card or something like that in the amount of time. And the most, the most amount that I can get in a, in a one minute deal, whoever gets the more, great, right? So you can actually make this a cardiology game. I did this with my residents on, on my telemetry service about six months ago. We, I made them play heads up. At the end of the week, I had taught them all of these things. So I wrote down, we, we had, uh, we used flecainide, we used ticasin, we talked about um, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. We did all of these things. Um, that week, that we learned different diagnoses, different medications, different tactics, different testing, all of those things. And I wrote all of the words down on index card. We had a stack of index cards like this, and I said, we're going to play heads up, right? Because that quick learning, if I can get them to say words and describe it to each other. So, so this guy, he's one of my third year res or second year residents, had something up here. And these guys are trying to explain it to him, like, get, say the word ticasin. Right? Say that word. Um, it's, it's the medicine that's used for atrial fibrillation, and we have to um, watch the QTC because if, if after the third dose, and they have to stay for three days, and you know, finally somebody says tikasin, right? right? But you have, you have to get people to say this. This is a cheap way to play a game on the floor, right? Heads up. Cardiology, heads up. Other quick games to play on the fly, and this is, this is <laughs> being on service with me. I like to play games. I'm not sure that everybody thinks they're as fun as I do, but a couple other games that I like to play. A scavenger hunt for my medical students and my residents. I give them a scavenger hunt of physical exam findings throughout the week. So I list 10 things. I need you to find these exam findings throughout the week before we are done with consults. Makes it a little bit fun. If they hear rails, great. If they hear a systolic ejection murmur, awesome. Um, sometimes I get it wrong. It also helps me be like, oh, no, that's not a systolic ejection murmur. That's a diastolic murmur. Like, we need to talk about this. Um, right? Ring of fire. Ring of fire is something that I do with a differential. If I want people to build a differential, then I stand around and I have, we all go in a circle. I play too. So what is the differential for chest pain? I go, you go, you go. We go around, around the ring until you can't do it anymore. And so if you don't have something that you can say, then you have to step out of the ring. Everybody keeps playing until nobody is left. So ring of fire. You have to make sure that it's safe. Nobody's, nobody excluded. If they can't think of something, then that's OK. Right? But it's fun. Everybody, everybody hears and learns, and you get to know where people and how far people step how early people step out. Right? And last but not least is innocent gambling. 
Innocent gambling, innocent gambling. I don't make anybody pay or put money down. Um, but anytime that we order something like a right heart cath or something like that, I say, okay, everybody, everybody put your money down. What's the RA going to be? What's your, what's your wedge going to be? What's your PA mean going to be? Right? What is, we're getting this. We might as well predict who's the closest. Who's the closest? And the person who wins, I buy coffee for. Right? So this is, this is all ways to do cheap gamification on the wards, anywhere else. This is, this is quick and easy. Okay, so think about it. I would argue that interactivity is going to change your world in the future, okay? And consider changing some of the physical space in which you learn. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to put whiteboards in here. You can just rearrange the desk slightly differently, okay? Explore areas outside of the physical space, so social media and anything else. Use those for ways to interact. And last but not least, try to play, right? Try to play just a little bit part of the day. It doesn't have to be all day, but play a small game here and there, and you can get people to learn a little bit faster, all right? Questions about interactivity? Okay, think about that. We're going to move on. So, who are these people? Who are these people? The good, good news. Actually, I, I, searched, I searched your web um, before I came here. I got to meet all these people. I didn't know that everybody, I was going to get to meet everybody, but these are some of your educators, right? These are some of your top educators in this institution. I would argue that the way they teach and the way they think about teaching you and training you is going to change. So the role of educator in andragogy is changing. The teacher is not the owner of content, right? You guys can go anywhere you want. You're on your phones all the time. I don't own that content. Google doesn't own that. ACC doesn't own that. And nobody owns that content, right? You can go anywhere you want. My role as a teacher, their role as teachers for you, is really to facilitate knowledge, right? They're, they don't hold, hold content and information, the guidelines, and then keep them secret and then only give them to you when you need them. That's not how it works. These are some of my favorite teachers. So Dr. O'Gara, Carol Warrens, Rick Nishimura. These are some of my favorite teachers. And they've taught me that the best teachers facilitate. The best teachers teach you how to find information, how to use information. They don't give you information. They facilitate knowledge. They facilitate your learning, right? And so some of this is going to change. So we're doing out with stage on the stage, right? I'm not going to stand up here and lecture. We're going to guide. We're going to guide. So a lot of the learning happens when I'm guiding you. When I'm saying, what do you think about this? Let's talk about this. Let's do this. What are you having trouble with? OK? So guide on the side is where it's at. And I think a lot of the national programs that you're going to are starting to move away with the person who just stands on the program. And they stands on the podium. They have people who are coming up and asking questions throughout. They have stop where they're doing, using audience response systems to answer questions during, right? So we are trying to figure out ways that we can facilitate learning rather than just give learning didactically or passively. This is one thing that we need to be careful of is, is the learner stage. And so this is a really nice graph of thinking about where the learner is at and where the teacher needs to be at. So if you have an early, this is the learner stages on the left-hand side. And your, your really advanced learner is a self-directed learner all the way down here. But if you're a dependent learner, you're not ready to be given full delegation. Your teacher should not be letting you go really, really far away, right? If you're an early stage learner, I need to be closer with you, right? I need to tell you a lot more. I need to guide you a little bit closer. And so that authority expert, we're going to be working hand in hand, and I'm not going to give you a big leash, right? When you're down at the bottom, you're a self-directed learner, I can be a delegator. I can tell you, go look this up. Come back to me with an answer. Let's talk about what you found and, and what that exploration was when you come back, right? So you really have to figure out what your learner stage is. And that gets back to what I've been talking about a little bit throughout this is the learning edge, right? So the learning edge is the point where the learner is mentally stimulated and challenged, but outside of their comfort zone, right? Still in an environment in where she doesn't feel threatened and um, is, is safe. Right? So this is your learning edge. And I love this graph because on this side is the difficulty of the task. If it's too hard, it's up here. And at the bottom is the learner's competency at the task. Okay? So if you are very competent and the task is easy, you're not going to learn very much. You're bored. I'm not challenged. This is really easy. Sinus tack, due to infection, done, move on. Right? That consult is not challenging for me. It's not very interesting. Right? But if, the, if I'm not very competent, I had a patient, or I, had a, I had a resident who uh, we had sinus bradycardia. He thought it was very easy, but he only had a differential of like two things for sinus bradycardia. And so the diff he thought the task was really, really easy, but it was much, much harder, right? And so that discussion 
that discussion is that sinus bradycardia moved him from here, what he thought was his comfort zone, to really here, this learning edge. When you function at the learning edge, where the task is a little bit challenging, but you still feel safe, okay? So safe, challenging task, not quite competent at it, close. That is where you are gonna learn the most. So I need to find the learner's edge for every one of my individual learners, right? Not everyone's the same, everybody grows differently, and so finding that edge as a facilitator and as an educator is really, really important, right? Because if I don't push you to that, you're not gonna learn. If I push you past it, you're really not gonna learn, right? You're too scared to function. It's not gonna be helpful. This is Bloom's taxonomy. This is another like famous medical educator pyramid. As, as, as an educator, depending on where my learner is at, I want to try to get my learners, my most advanced learners up to create. Really, it really in, in medical education and in, in, in training, we are creating is really doing the research, right? This is, this is where you are. Can I get you to the point where you're actually doing research and creating knowledge? Creating things, right? A lot of times I'm really, I'm happy if I can get my fellows to analyze and evaluate, right? But if I'm at create, man, winning the game, winning. Right? All right, so the future, this is hard to do. As medical educators, you're medical, you, are, you guys are lucky, you have great medical educators. Um, and, and they have to learn things. They have to learn more things now because it's gotten, it's gotten a little bit tough. Medical education is complicated now. And so they should learn adult learning theory. They should know what blended and flipped and virtual classrooms are. They have to find out what interactive and experiential learning means and how to do it. They have to know what learning analytics is. They have to apply gamification. They have to be able to do evaluation and assessment. This is hard stuff. Right? This is hard stuff. And so I would argue that some of the people who are in charge of these programs should do certificates and degrees. If you are interested in being somebody who is in charge of a lot of learners and a charge of training, you probably should get a little extra training because it's, it's complicated. right? And even if you don't get a master's degree or a certificate, you can go to programs. You can do the emerging faculty program like Dr. Lynn did and, and see these are these things that you do. And, and this is going to continue to grow. These MD, MED, um, degree programs are going to continue to grow. You can find them online. You're going to continue to get certificates and, and background in this. And that's great, but that's not for everybody. And the likelihood of us being able to train all of our faculty in that is pretty low. So one would argue that we should do bite-sized faculty development. And this is what I like to do at Pitt, is bite-sized, right? Because that's all I have time for. Because <laughs> every single year, Dr. Little and I have to fill out a form that says, what faculty development did you do this year? I don't know what pilot development I did this year. But this counts, right? So bringing a medical educator to do grand rounds, this counts. Yes. OK, so you can count it. Count it as your faculty development for the month. Exactly. But I would argue that you can do bite size faculty development everywhere. So you can include in medical education articles at your journal club, just one, once a year. You can do that. That's pretty easy. Mandate 10 minutes on med-ed topics at the quarterly division meeting. So I do this. My chief lets me do 10 minutes every, every division meeting that I talk about how to give feedback, wellness, burnout, recruitment, those sorts of things we talk about. 10 minutes, that's it. Really easy, really quick. All of my, all of my uh, faculty now can do me the, the feedback uh, method that I've taught them, which is the ask, tell, ask method. And they all, because I've done it, like reviewed it with them every single time, they can all give it to me, which is wonderful. They wouldn't, were not able, they were, were doing the sandwich method before. So if you, if you are doing the sandwich feedback method, don't do that anymore. It's not supposed to be the way that you do it. Um, other ways to do it, start your clinical competency committees with five to 10 minutes of relevant faculty. Faculty, faculty development. So it doesn't have to be a half day retreat. It doesn't have to be an hour long talk. It really can just be these five to 10 minute things where we get people a little bit more advanced in the, in the theories of medical education and the things that we are doing. Right? OK, I'm going to, we're in the last couple minutes. I'm going to give you guys a couple um, minutes to ask questions. But in case you missed it, adult learning principles are the foundation of what we should be doing for cardiology training. The future of medical education will include data, interactivity, and educators. Okay. These will change and continue to evolve over the next 5, 10, 20 years in different ways. Okay. We are already starting with a lot of these things, but I think learning analytics, gamification, and, and really much more, uh, much more complicated training of our educators um, is going to continue to happen as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to stop and let you guys answer questions. Thank you so much for oh, you're coming. Welcome. Uh, we can count this as a as a great yeah. education uh, session. Okay. 
Um, I have a question for you, mostly for the challenge of program directors and yeah. education. I think, uh, you know, we're fortunate to hear you. Obviously, uh, uh, Pat O'Gara came here as well as Rick Nishimura and, and uh, Carol Warns and all of The question to you is, we have so many uh, programs for training in the nation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there is so much heterogeneity mm -hmm. of how we do yep. education and training. Yep. What are we doing for these program directors besides meeting at yeah. ACC uh, scientific sessions one oh, gosh, time, I want, I love et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We need to do something yep. at least to elevate the game right. of teaching with all the newer modalities that you're bringing on board, conceivably testing it. Yeah beyond your own institution right. and uh, so i think i'm so glad you are on you know the learning committee and so many other things the question is which are direction going? are we going yeah. nationally so i'm glad that you answered asked that that gives me the opportunity to share a couple of things so the acc i'm highly involved in the american college of cardiology so i guess i should list that as like maybe a conflict of interest of some sort but um so we have we have a new curriculum that's coming out it's going to be an online curriculum for program directors and associate program directors that's going to be somewhat of this so a little bit of curriculum building um, recruitment, visa stuff, those sorts of things. That's going to be online. Anybody is going to be able to have access to it. The other couple of things that are moving on, the emerging faculty is going to continue to grow. So that program continues to be the place where if you want um, your faculty to go and get a little bit more extra training on, on education and, and speaking and those sorts of things that will happen. There's been a bigger discussion recently about should we have an extra day or another um, another meeting at Hart House for program directors to bring them in to do that. And I think that's um, we're trying to get funding for that. Um, but that's everybody, I think, is starting to recognize that this is hard stuff. And that if we really want to advance things and move things forward, we need to A, take a little bit of risk, and B, take, spend a little bit of money. Good, thanks. OK, uh, I'll call you to, to call other people to get the ACC to pay for that. Um, <laughs> I need that. All right, go ahead. As we move further in our training, I feel programs are becoming smaller and more intimate. Okay. How do we protect fellows an, uh, being anonymous during feedback mm -hmm. or not getting in trouble for giving true feedback at some point? I feel there's a lot of fear. Or that you give feedback, you, you give feedback give to feedback, their, yeah. I feel educators are very open in giving feedback. Yep. And then, and that that you guys are challenged a little bit to give feedback that that will come back and and, and bite you. Yeah. Um, that's hard. It's really hard. Um, and I, I think it's a challenge as as leaders in education. We want to take that feedback and make changes. And if I if I have to keep it super secret, that's then it's really hard to make some changes. And so I think there has to be a discussion about what privacy means and what what anonymity means. Um, a lot of times we can't keep you totally anonymous. There are ways, though, that program directors, if we work together, wait for short periods of times, have larger discussions, go back to groups and get more information, um, that we can keep you a little bit safer. Uh, but I, I will say that you know the reality of the reality of life for for learners. And when when I get when I'm faculty and I go to my chair or my chief to say, hey, this is some of the feedback. They try to protect me a little bit, but but it, you know part of this is like owning it, right? Part of this and part of our job as teachers is to, to give you guys the ability to give feedback and to stand on that feedback and to say, this is this how I feel. And so really, we have to make it safe for you to give feedback. That's your leader's job is to be able to give feedback so that, and that, that retaliation is not going to come. There's always a risk of that. Um, and our job is to teach you to be resilient if when retaliation comes back, and then how to navigate those retaliative things. So keep giving feedback. I would encourage all of the learners to give feedback, even if it doesn't feel good, even if it's uncomfortable. You grow just like you learn when you're a little bit uncomfortable. You grow as a person when you're a little bit uncomfortable, too. Don't be too scared of the retaliation. Yeah. Hi, Katie. Thanks. Hey. That was a great uh, presentation. So uh, I think you've alluded to this a little bit, which is you know, in, in, the, in medicine, we've got lots of research that we do devices, yep. drugs, because there's somebody that's funding this. Right. How do you get funding for, because this is an uh, area we, we yeah. clearly have not done enough yeah. in, but how do you get funding to do this? Is this at the national yeah. level, yeah. federal payers? Are you just trying to get yeah. people to donate money? Um, so there's a couple things. So education funding is really tough. 
Um, but you can find it in, in smaller avenues. Education, it's not, it's not as expensive either as, as randomized controlled trials, so a little bit is el elbow grease. Um, so you don't need as much money um, unless you're doing some of the fancy sim stuff or, or big classrooms that you're doing. Um, I, would, I would argue that the money that I have found has come through um, institution money. So a lot of the institutions will have ways to, get, to do better patient care, better patient safety, those sorts of things. They have innovation grants, which they're a lot more willing to do that. There's um, philanthropy will fund these a little bit more quickly than, um, than any, but there's no, there's no NIH for education. Um, ACC and AHA, I think, are getting much more involved in, in piloting these things. And also, ABIM and ACGME, those are the other organizations that we play with, are, are starting to pilot things and try things a little bit more. They don't have a ton of money to give, but they do have some here and there, so that they'd be willing to pair with you. So it's, it's tough. I will tell you that it's, that it's tough, but you don't need a ton. You don't need a few thousand here, a few thousand there. You need access to you know, survey programs and survey monkey and those sorts of things. And um, you don't need most of, most of the stuff is really easy, like low level stuff, change something, write a few tests, like create a few cases. That's, that's volunteer fellows and residents work. And then um, employ, right? So it's, it's not, you can do things cheaply. Um, and, and I would argue that that's, that's what we should start with, is, is how to do it, something. Just flip, right? Restructure and flip and see what, see what happens. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned briefly about using performance data as part of sort of the evaluation process. Yep. And I think that's one thing in our program we've struggled with. We use Epic. Um, I think there's a lot of data. There's a dashboard. But it's mm -hmm. trying to incorporate it into like a usable way. Yeah. Um, you mentioned sort of the dirty data, which I think we struggle with, where patients are not necessarily appropriately assigned or the metrics that we yep. see doesn't represent the care that they've received. Sometimes it's technical. Right. Um, how did how does your program sort of use or optimize that performance, performance data, data and yeah. to I guess improve the the patient care? Oh, to improve the patient care. Gosh, that's a tough question. I don't know that we've we've gotten to the point where we can improve the patient care based on I our mean, or even just maybe I guess improve like the the learner's um, you know ability to recognize that it's there and that it's. Yeah, know, one day will be for patient care. Right. So I, I, a couple things on that. The, the epic and the dashboard is dirty. It is, right? It, it's not necessarily reflective completely of the fellow's performance because they have an attending who is working with them. So there's an attending that is attached to every single incident. Um, and and there's, there's patient behavior and everything else that goes in with that. And so part of my job is to teach fellows that your performance data probably is never going to be clean. Right? And, and that your performance really, in, in any system that you move forward, even as faculty, are, my job is to teach you that. Right, We have to talk about that and if they can come up with ways to measure their performance only. The only times that I've been able to successfully look at performance data, and this is a hard thing to keep going, um, is after a 24-hour call or evening call, um, that I, I, I have them choose one or two patients that they see, and then we review it specifically to do a performance on, on what that is. That's a hard thing to do um, consistently. It's a lot of work, um, but that would be the only thing. And then your clinical competency committees are, are supposed to function as um, a group that looks at overall performance. So I can ask somebody, how did this person read in the echo lab? How did this person, you know, when they saw patients overnight and you are the consults attending and you got those patients, what did their notes look like? What was the, what was the clinical decision making? Those sorts of things. I've encouraged my fellows whenever I'm on service and they take call, they email me in the morning and say, can you give me feedback on these two patients? These, these, are, the, these are the patients that I identify as having trouble with. Um, and and I, these were the two decisions that I wasn't exactly sure. And then I will go back to them and say these are the you know this is what I did or did not change this is what I did you know you can implement things and say this is a form choose one patient that you saw every single call about which clinical decision you were unsure of following the next day did they change anything did they not did you reflect all those things it's a lot um, but that's the only way that you can really do performance like true performance data right pick one and do it yeah you can't get you can't it's just too much data to to collect but it, i would encourage everybody to just do one small piece bite size right bite size we we can't collect all data at all times it's just too much katie yeah, yeah. first of all that was phenomenal thank you i'm sorry all the surgeons weren't couldn't be here because they're up in the operating room i think we'll make them watch this at our next five oh great because thanks because i think it's really a, a superb overview and things that we are very interested in and so one of the things i encourage you to do is look at other industries we kind of run this meeting yep. called pumps and pipes we get together with the oil and gas guys we get together with nasa 
And so industrial gaming began right. in oil and gas. Yeah. And what they did was they took, for example, the CAD drawing of an offshore rig, and they will put you on it and present you with emergencies. And you huh. had to be able to respond by moving virtually okay. around the rig. You know, where's the lifeboat if there's a fire over base, you get oil derrick number three. So that's one example of it. Number two is how NASA trains astronauts. Yeah. They get one shot, okay? Yep. You, don't, you don't get basically right. to do it wrong. You so they have space. very, yeah. very specific protocols how they train astronauts. And so I think there are a bunch of different education things that we can get from other industries. We tend Completely to be agree. very myopic in how Completely we agree. build these things. Yep. And I think there's opportunities to make big leapfrog opportunities by yeah. in, involving that. Last thing I want to talk to you about was you showed that matrix about how people learn differently. Yep. Now, that experiment was run in California school systems. And so and it kind of fits with what we think. I don't, you don't need to come to Houston for me to give you a lecture. I right. can deliver a lecture to you anywhere in the world. You need to come down here to do how you teach. Right. You interact with people. There's a very different lecture that you've given today from anybody else who's coming down here right. and giving a lecture. And I think that's the style. If you're going to travel, it needs to be, number one, you learn some, to do, how to do something with your hands. Mm -hmm. Or two, it's that interactivity right. that you're talking about that is so important. So what they did in California was they, they pushed a lot of the learning. You could do it anywhere. You know, all these things were online. You could do it at home. You could do it on the beach. Yep. You could do it wherever. And it was all tracked. And what you basically were looking at is what that graphic was. There are those people who are so good, they're ahead of the curve. Right. There are those people who are behind the curve, and there are people who are on the curve. If people are on the curve, you can just keep doing. As a teacher, you want to challenge the people who are doing really well, and yeah. they, because we, we give the same delivery right. for all of these people. And right. so what it allowed them to do was find the people who were struggling, and sometimes they realign the really good people with the people who are struggling to help them basically yeah. bring things along. Yeah, that's and another so wonderful method. The teaching yeah. and how you interacted with people to get everybody basically on that glide yeah. curve. But it wasn't the same delivery for every student who's out there. <laughs> now, we're a long way from yeah. being able to do that. But I, but I think you're right on in terms basically of the concepts of how yeah. to teach. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to say, though this is not coming across great, um, if anything was really interesting and you want to learn more about trends in medical education, there's this report that comes out every single year um, called the Horizon Report, Higher Education Edition. It's the NMC Horizon Report. And it'll talk about short-term trends, medium-term trends, and long-term trends. Um, you know, some of the long-term trends are robotics and whatnot. Um, but you can, you can go to any of these. A lot of the e-learning industry will have some of the faculty development and backgrounds of adult learning principles. These are all, again, learning from other industries is really important. And medical education really is not advanced. Um, we are behind the curve, um, light years behind the curve, really, really in, in higher level education and undergrad and graduate, they are way, way, way ahead of us. And so if we if we take from those people and really apply to medical education, we can. And, and that report, that NMC report, comes out every single year in about January or February, and I read it every year. Um, it's fascinating. It's a, it's a little bit long, but um, they have examples across the across the world, really, of what they are doing in other different places and really, really cool things. Um, that happened. So um, thank you so much for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. It was a fun morning and um, hope you have a good day.